Welcome to the Freshman Foundation Podcast, helping you make the jump from high school athletics to the collegiate level and beyond with your host, Michael Huber. Hey everyone, it's Mike Huber, founder and CEO of the Freshman Foundation and certified mental performance consultant. If you're listening to this episode, then you're likely a student athlete or family member of one. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Hopefully you find our podcast valuable. Mental performance coaching allows young athletes to show up at their best every single day by conquering distractions, pressures, and mental roadblocks through evidence-based strategies. So let's talk. You can visit my website at Michael, V as in Vincent Huber, dot com to schedule a free strategy session. Let's see if mental performance coaching is a fit for your family. Enjoy this episode and thank you again for listening. How has Elijah McAllister remained humble in his journey from New Jersey to Nashville? College sports today are simply big business. National exposure often comes in the high school recruiting process. Now, social media and NIL opportunities are making some high school athletes into celebrities before they even get to college. It might seem rare to find an elite college athlete that is humble and service-driven as they pursue success. However, these young people do exist and persevere without much fanfare. My guest on this episode, Elijah McAllister, is a redshirt senior captain of the Vanderbilt University football team. Elijah starred for a state football power in his home state of New Jersey. His dedication to athletic and personal development led him to attend a prestigious academic institution in the most prestigious athletic conference in the country, the SEC. As you will learn, Elijah is quite humble and prioritizes helping others. In episode 44, Elijah discusses how he developed into a mature young man with the help of his trusted coaches. His high school coaches were critical to preparing Elijah for the move to Nashville. Elijah also shares about the challenges he faced in the transition from high school to college. Finally, he discusses his mission to serve young people through his all-for-one, one-for-all foundation. I'm excited for this conversation. Let's build your foundation with Elijah McAllister. Hey, Elijah, how's it going? It's going well. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for coming on to the podcast. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. It's an honor. Yeah. So, you know, for those listening, I reached out to Elijah because I live in the same area that he grew up in and uh, spent a couple of nights here and there watching him play football out at the local high school. And my kids will be going to his uh, alma mater, uh, Rumson Fairhaven High School. So I reached out to him to see if we could have a conversation about what he's doing today. So from New Jersey to Nashville, tell me about your choice to go to Vanderbilt to play college football. Yeah, so the choice to go play college football at Vanderbilt was an interesting one. Um, I had a kind of, I'd say, a roller coaster ride in terms of my athletic uh, career in general. I actually almost quit playing football in eighth grade. I never really got good at football until – I could catch up to my body. Like I was always a tall, lean guy. So it was hard for me to play football. I was always pretty good at basketball. Um, and I, I'm sure we'll get into you know, my high school career later, but just how I ended up at Vanderbilt, I really just wanted to go to a school where I could, that would challenge me on the field and off the field as well. I would play in the best conference in the, in the world, the SEC, and we also compete in the classroom with the best and brightest minds in the world. So it's just a, the best of both works for me to try to attack and do everything I want to do in his life, not just play football or not just impact community, not just uh, be a good, good in academic standing, but do everything I want to do in life. So that's kind of why I chose him. Yeah, it's a, it's a great academic university. And <clears throat> I actually, believe it or not, wanted to go there when I was your age, not necessarily to play football, but, you know, just in terms of seeing a different part of the world. And, and Nashville is very different in 2022 than it was when I, when I was looking to go to school. But I still imagine there was a pretty big, cultural difference like what were some of the things that you had to adapt to when you you left new jersey and you moved to the south yeah i mean i'm, I'm sure you get it sometimes uh if you travel a lot or you kind of go meet different people like the first thing was like people were telling me i talk too fast and so you <laughs> just new jersey new york talking fast moving fast well, that was the first thing but that's kind of one of the reasons why i really wanted to come to vanderbilt i wanted to get out of the northeast and kind of see a different way of life um 
And it was important for me to kind of do that for myself and learning about myself more, uh, getting away from uh, some family or way of life I already knew, uh, which is important for me to do. And that's the kind of the reason why I chose Vanderbilt. So just me talking fast is one of the main things that guys used to give me mess about uh, at first and just a different culture in terms of like food, barbecue, uh, country music as well down here is big. So little things like that. But it's honestly was a seamlessly, uh, seemingly easy transition for me just going through it as, as I was a freshman. Yeah. And from, from a football perspective, I was kind of checking out some of the <clears throat> the information on the school's website and there was a video, you know, when you left high school, you were what, like maybe 210, now you're 270. What's, the, what's that transition been like to put on that, that amount of weight in the last few years? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was a crazy transition because like I'm, I'm a guy, like I said, I, like I said earlier, I love basketball and I was a basketball kid my whole life pretty much. That's why I have, I was so skinny. Like, I was Lauren limbs and, and I was always pretty athletic, but, you know, playing football, you need to have some strength to you. So just I vividly remember my first couple practices here, uh, playing defensive end here at Vanderbilt just in college. And it was just so funny, me being out there just running around. <laughs> they used to call me Bambi because my legs are super skinny and stuff. I'm <laughs> skinny, just running around. But that transition was amazing, just gaining that weight and being able to uh, add on that good weight, good muscle to help me play better and be uh, – a contributor on the team, which is amazing. That's kind of obviously why I had to do it because you can't play defensive end in this conference at 210 pounds. You can barely do it at 230. So just being up to 270, having a lot of muscle, being able to play our position at a high level is important. Has it, has the, the weight gain, how, how has it impacted your, your speed or your mobility? Um, honestly, uh, it's helped my, my speed and my mobility because the stronger I've gotten in my lower body, the faster I've gotten. Obviously, you know, just having natural lifts is important, but the more strength you can put in the ground, uh, the faster you'll be because you'll put more force in the ground and then push it Yeah, off. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I have to imagine that. And, and again, for those who are listening, you know, the for a high school program here in New Jersey, there's a pretty sophisticated weight room culture at RFH. Yeah, and yeah. but I can't I can't even imagine what it looks like going to an SEC weight room, right? You're going from, you know, you know, high school or college at the highest level, you know, you probably have been exposed to some pretty interesting techniques and uh, you know, things in, in the weight room there that have really opened your eyes, I I would imagine. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's funny that I was as I was explaining the the speed and the strength in the lower body, I sounded like Coach Rock, who's the high school strength coach. Uh, here, here at Rush Fair Haven Regional. Yeah. He kind of really helped me in my first part of my life transition into that defensive uh, end spot and Division one football player from getting me to probably, like, I'd say 150 when I first got to high school to 210. And then coming here, he was pivotal on my success to get to college. And then coming here at Vanderbilt and the, the coaches pushing me here, uh, that was a great transition. I think Rora prepared me. Uh, he, he prepared me big time for being ready in the weight room in terms of, like, how you operate uh, within a college weight room, but the college weight room uh, and, and strength coaches here pushed me to obviously pack on that weight, um, get those muscles and kind of be able to contribute here. Yeah. So, I mean, al along the same lines, just, you know, beyond the weight room, I mean, again, I'm going to talk a little bit about RFH because I know a little bit about it, but you came from a very successful program, right? A very unique football, high school football culture, winning culture, highly successful. Like, what did you learn as a football player at RFH that you've taken with you to Vanderbilt? Oh, man. I mean, I've learned so much there uh, just from a football standpoint, also as a man. I look at certain guys and coaches that poured into me while I was there. Coach Orock, obviously, uh, Coach Schulte, Coach Quinn, and and those those three guys honestly were huge into my my development as a man as a football player. One of the main things I learned when I was at RFH, obviously, you know, I, I could have went to a lot of different high schools and, and been the man um, and just played offense, defense, and caught a ton of touchdowns and got a ton of sacks and probably would have been great for my ego at the time, right? But one of the main things I learned uh, uh, about myself and about football is how much I love the game for its camaraderie and the team aspect of it. I mean, we're one of the few high schools in New Jersey, especially public high schools, that only let our guys go one way um, and not play offense, defense, and really mm -hmm. have a team-oriented style of running the football, playing really good defense. And no matter what kind of guys we have, essentially, um, on the roster, it's not tailored towards players, it's tailored towards the program. And, and that standard that we built there um, and that they built before I got there and that have continued to build since I was there has kind of allowed me to develop as a man and, and a football player. So now, like, 
you know, I throw the ego out the window. The, the personal things don't really matter. It's about the team success and how I can be a better leader, um, a better person to, to my friends and my teammates. Yeah. Well, that, that probably, that probably lends itself to the fact that you were named captain of your team for the upcoming 22 season. So tell me about that. What was it like to be named captain in a program like Vanderbilt in the SEC and having gone through, you know, we could talk a little bit more about it, gone through some challenges, you know, in terms of injuries and things like that transition. Like what was it like to be named captain of your, of your team? I mean, it was an honor and it was truly special because it was voted by my teammates. You know, those are guys that you spend every day with and, and mm-hmm. that, you know, to have that respect from a hundred plus peers of yours, it's just amazing. It's, it's a humbling thing to be able to uh, wear that, that C on my chest and go out there every Saturday and represent my family, my teammates, uh, this university at a very high level. Uh, it was just, it was just a great uh, feeling for me, not, not personally, but it's just to see, to know that like what I say, um, and the impact I have on people's lives is important in some aspect. Um, and it was just great for me just to have that honor to do that last year. And hopefully this year I can do the yeah. same, just being able to um, have that respect and, and, and understanding from my peers, which is amazing. Yeah, I think respect is, is is a key word in that, right? You know, in order to be, you know, named a captain and voted on by your teammates, it means that, you know, you're probably doing something every single day that maybe you don't even realize that they see, you know, in terms of just showing up to work right? Putting in the work and being humble and, you know, being team first and, and me second. And I think that that's not always, you know, that's not, not always that common, you know, especially at yeah. the level that you play at where guys are the man, you know, in high school. And then you come to college football and it's probably can be pretty humbling at times. Oh, for sure. I mean, that's always a unique learning curve you get to see from the freshmen and sometimes sophomores as well. Everybody was the guy at their high school were all recruited to play this great game we love at a high level and everybody was the man at their school. So just coming in and trying to put that ego aside and uh, come together as a unit within your class and within the upperclassmen as well to, to provide the best product on the field. Just a, it's just a unique uh, learning curve you see, especially from the young guy. Yeah. It's something I had to go through as well too. Sure. What, what's been the hardest, what was the hardest part or what's been the hardest part about going from high school football to college football? <sighs> man. Uh, I'd probably say just the, the, like, I know it sounds crazy, but everyone is good <laughs> Every week in and week out, especially in this conference and, and at practice on the roster, like you have to compete every single day, no matter what we have. One of our, one of our things we talk about here is earning it every day. Like no matter what I did yesterday, no matter what I did in the past, no matter what I think I'm going to do tomorrow. Whatever I'm doing in that present moment, I have to earn it every day. So that's your your spot on the depth chart. That's uh, your grades in the classroom. That's uh, your relationships off the field. That's uh, us playing another opponent week in and week out. Like you see it in the SEC. Everybody beats everybody consistently on a week in and week out basis. And that's the biggest transition from high school and college. You know, on and off the field, just the, the competition. Every single day, you have to earn your right, your place to be certain places every single day. And that's kind of probably the biggest transition. The second thing I say is just like I talked about the big the weight transition was huge for me. I felt like I was I was athletic enough and had enough skill to at least contribute somewhat my freshman year, and I did really well on scout team. Um, but I just wasn't heavy enough, and that was just the most frustrating part for me. It's probably the toughest part because when you're a young guy, you really want to play and, and show that you're you're uh, you can do this thing at a high level, especially when you when you're first coming from high school. Everybody's expecting you to go out there and have ten plus sacks your first year, which is probably impossible but you, you you need to have so much many other factors that have to go into uh, being able to play at this level and that was probably the toughest thing the second toughest thing that, that i'd say just going through college just the frustration of not playing feel like you want to contribute and be out there for your team and, and showcase your skills and you can't do that mm-hmm. how, how much did you have to eat to put on that weight Oh my goodness, a lot. <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> oh, yeah, it, it was a lot. And, and the crazy part about it is like a lot of people think like, well, I just can't eat that much. But you have to train your gut. Like your gut is something that you can train. So like mm-hmm. initially I couldn't eat as much as I do now because I'm not used to eating that much and that often and that consistency. So it was it was a ton of food. I'm talking about like every single day. Um, try to eat like four or five meals before noon. I mean, obviously, you know, we wake up pretty early, 5 a.m. So I try mm-hmm. to read three to five things before noon so that I'm front loading instead of back loading, um, 
which is important as I get to work out and develop my body in the right way. So that was, was definitely a lot, uh, a lot of food. Sometimes I go to sleep with my stomach hurting and different things like that, but I knew I had to do it. <laughs> so it was funny. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously there's been a big physical transition in terms of your body and weightlifting and nutrition and like just kind of keeping up with the competition from a, from a mental perspective, like, are there any specific adjustments or things that you've done mentally to be able to, you know, make that adjustment and ultimately get to the point you're at right now? Yeah. So, I mean, the mental side of the game is huge for me, mm -hmm. uh, just life in general, uh, for various different reasons. I mean, to the point where I, I studied psychology here at uh, Vanderbilt uh, for my undergrad, and that was just huge for me because that's something I enjoy learning about. Um, the mental side of the game, the, the biggest transition for me uh, from, from high school to college and that was just the the self-talk. Um, I think we go through a lot of times where we listen to our thoughts instead of talking to ourselves. So we have to talk to ourselves instead of listening. So, you know, when you have a bad play, a bad drive, a bad practice, we go through the day and we're like, oh, man, that was bad. I stink. Uh, coach is going to yell at me during film, blah, 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 blah. And you're dwelling on that play, that practice, that time. And then soon enough, the time goes by and everything's over with <laughs> while everybody's still standing upwards. So we have to talk to our stuff instead of listen to ourselves. So I feel like in some ways I used to motivate myself by putting myself down like, oh, you're not good enough. They say you're not this, you're not that. And try to motivate myself through that way. But now instead, instead I just, by listening to the noise, but now instead I just talk to myself, reassure myself that I'm grateful to play this game, that I'm good enough to be here, to not only be here, but to succeed and just talk to myself positively every single day. That's, that's the biggest transition for sure. Yeah. I, I love the way you put that because that's something I talk to athletes about all the time, which is, you know, when you're talking to yourself or you're thinking about what happened the last play or the last 10 plays, or you're thinking about the next play or the next 10 plays, you can't be present in the moment, right? Like you said, like time just passes you by. And meanwhile, like it's not, it's not possible to be your best in the moment if you're distracted by those thoughts, right? So you have to learn how to control them. And what it sounds like you've done is really learn how to, to manage them and reframe them and, and basically not let the self-talk, not, not let your subconscious be convinced by the, the things that you might say to yourself. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the only thing that's guaranteed when we're talking about competition or sports is adversity. So once you understand that, like you're going to have a player you don't feel like is up to standard or you're going to be down by a touchdown, another team going to score, something's going to happen. You're going to have an injury, anything. Adversity yeah. is guaranteed in sports. And once you understand that and know how to kind of mitigate yeah. through that and understand, like, that's going to be there, but we know how to handle that and process that by self-talk is going to be super important. So that's kind of what I learned a lot. Yeah. Yeah, ex right. Accepting the fact that it's going to be hard. There's things that are just not going to go your way. And if you try to resist that, it's just going to make it worse. I I'm curious at, at Vanderbilt, do you have – folks on staff, like sports psychology folks that you can go to or work with the team? Yeah, yeah, we have a mental performance coach. This, this will be her second year on here, okay. uh, Kayleen Curry. Um, and she does a great job with uh, connecting up with different uh, leadership uh, groups and meetings with different people, one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings as well. She's been uh, pivotal to our transition as far as the team in terms of mindset here at Vanderbilt. Um, and this is her second year. Coach Lee brought her uh, here uh, with him because um, we didn't have anyone kind of like this on staff before in my earlier yeah. years. And she's been important to the development of the mindset of our teams. All right. Awesome. Well, I, I believe Coach Lee came from Notre Dame. Is that, is that correct? Yes. Yes, he did. He was the defensive coordinator for both. Yeah, he was the D coordinator at Notre Dame, right? So Notre Dame has somebody on staff there. I know they have someone on staff there that's still there that does it, right? So it's not surprising yeah. to hear that he brought someone with him. And I think that's a great thing. And, and, and in terms of transitions, right, like – you were recruited by Coach Mason? Yes, yes. And Coach Mason <laughs> left the program, let, yeah. let, let go, and you get a new coach come in. Like, what's that transition been like trying to build a relationship with a new coach and kind of reestablish yourself as somebody, you know, who wants to be a big part of the program? Yeah, I think anytime when you when you talk about like, new people that you have to kind of get to know, the main thing is going to come down to is really trust, um, trusting each other, and, and that takes time and consistency. So, you know, I built that trust and understanding with Coach Mason for, from the time I was recruited to the time he left. We got let go. It's like two and a half, three years. Um, and then being able to build that trust uh, with Coach Lee's past year and a half, almost two, well, year and some change, year and a half, um, has been important uh, to building our relationship 
through that trust, through that understanding and, and just conversations. So um, at first it was a little difficult because they're, they're different uh, people, obviously. So they're yeah. different people. So you can't really go in as every situation the same as you have been in the past, but now our relationship is as strong as ever um, through uh, the season and through adversity, through good times. Uh, it's, it's been, it's been a great transition, a great relationship to be able to connect with them uh, this past, past, past year and a half. Um, and now we're just super excited together to go in the season uh, hand in hand. So, that's great. Um, and I know you've had a couple of ACL yeah. tears, you know, one in high school and then one your junior year. Can you talk about that process, how you sort of, you know, work through that, the recovery, how that sort of affected you or impacted you as a player? I know those are pretty significant things to go through and traumatic in some ways. Like what, what's the, what is that? What effect has that had on you as a, as a person and a player? Yeah, I mean that's crazy. The the biggest effect it probably had on me is as a as a person for sure. Uh, well, first I'll start with just the, the high school injuries, and that was kind of the. I remember first uh, getting the call from a doctor and, and, and knowing that I tore my ACL. Like that's like one of the things you say when you're younger. Like I don't want to tear my ACL. Like you think like all oh, the great athletes did. Something happens to them. You but. I think it's like the worst thing in the world. So I remember, and the first person I, I talked to that knew besides my, me and my dad was uh, Coach Orark. I went to his office and I just cried because I was, not because I, I knew I couldn't handle the rehab or the, the adversity that was was placed upon me. It was because I was felt like I was letting him and the team down for not being available for the upcoming season. Um, and that kind of speaks to my mindset as far as through the injury. Like I, I attacked that head on, um, had good spirits each time, especially during that high school time, good spirits each time, going through the injury process, and then just, just hit it head on. But what it did for me, honestly, uh, from a personal level, is it humbled me uh, to allow me to understand that this game is not forever. Like, I've never been hurt before than any sport I ever played. I was always pretty pretty solid at, at the things I did, picked up. So I kind of took took the game for granted, uh, took this life for granted because, you know, I, I, was, I was always just going out there and playing and having fun and doing what I did. So it just humbled me and allowed me to understand like how how easily everything could be taken away from me like that, especially and and through football, through sports, but in life that allowed me to cherish the things I love the most. And then and then in college, I mean that that process was was easy. Like it was really easy. I I knew what I had to do. I had been through it before. Um, it was just like whatever. Like obviously it was frustrating, but I mean cool. I've done it before, um, and I can do it again. So that's kind of how it affected me mentally. Then from a physical standpoint, I mean, I've had great people in my life that allowed me to to push through these things. So it's obviously affected me physically in, in some ways uh, in terms of my flexibility and mobility uh, through my lower body. But I work on it every single day so that it's not a bigger drop off as people may seem. Uh, I mean, I, I, I started last year and uh, hopefully be able to start again. So Obviously, it's not something that's super, super, like, daunting to my ability to play football. It, it's – like I tell people all the time, if, if some if I can do it, you can do it too. Like, it's affecting me physically, but I'm still out here playing and doing the things I love to do and fulfilling all my dreams that I had before injury, uh, post-first off, post-second off, all that. So it's, yeah. it's, it's good. Yeah, it's amazing how something like that can can really give you perspective. And I think, listen, there's a couple ways to go, right? You could feel sorry for yourself and say, why me? Or you could say, why not me? Right. And it sounds yeah. like you chose the latter of like, Hey, listen, like this isn't granted forever. Like, let me, let me go face this adversity head on so that I can become not only a, a better athlete, but a stronger person. And I think that, you know, one of the tools that we use in, in mental performance coaching, that's, that's probably underrated and, and kind of gets unnoticed is gratitude, right? Like, you know, it's easy to dwell on the things that you're not happy about, but think about all the things that you've been granted through your hard work and you get to a place like Vanderbilt and this is not directed at you, but just any athlete, right? You get to college and you're playing sports and every, you know, 98% of the people before you had to, you know, retire because they weren't good enough. Right. So at, at a certain point, it's like, Hey, I'm lucky to be here and I'm lucky to have the opportunity to get stronger and it's going to make me a better person. It's going to build my character. But I think when you're in it, right, it's not always the easiest thing to do because you're thinking about like, 
what's going to happen next. Am I going to be able to play again or at the level I want to? And it sounds like it's, it's served you well, right? I mean, I think all things being equal athletes would prefer not to get injured, but that's just part of the deal in football. Right. So what are you going to do? You're going to, you're going to, you're going to make it, you're going to be better because of it, or you're going to, you're going to let it get you down. Yeah. Um, that, that's so interesting. I've talked to, talked about that. I mean, how, how do you see that? Like from your perspective, how do you see that differ from sport to sport? Like I feel like football players, they kind of aren't as easy to talk about different mental things and different processes in that. And from the mindset standpoint, because they think physical has got to go fast and be violent and go hit. Mm-hmm. And I'm fine. But how have you seen that different from sports, specifically football, like how the mental performance side of the game is important? You know, honestly, I don't, I I mean, obviously all the sports have different demands mentally. Um, You know, I I think for me, the, the, the thing about football is because it moves so fast. I had spent some time working with a quarterback. Um, who was a high school quarterback in California and he was looking to play college football. And I think the one thing that I, I really tried to instill in him, which is hard sometimes is mindfulness, right? Like when things are going so fast and flying so fast around you, like really just being able to stay present in what's, what's happening. Right. And not getting caught up in the emotion of it. Right. And you're right. And I don't think it's just football players. I think it's, if anything, I would say it's more of a gender thing. I think males Mm -hmm. just generally have a harder time opening up and talking about the things that they're thinking and feeling to other people. And I think females are much more open to that, you know, and whether that's stereotypical or not, I'm not sure. I mean, that's my experience limited as it may be. Um, But listen, football is a, it's a, it's a brutal game. Right. And personally, I think there's most to be gained from mental performance coaching in football because of all of the demands, physical and mental and all of the struggles and the pain and all these things that you go through, but it doesn't seem to have kind of caught up. I mean, baseball is sort of the leader in mental skills coaching and everything else is like a distant second, but it seems like it's changing. I mean, you guys have one on staff. I know Notre Dame does. Uh, I know Alabama does, right? The big programs do. And then I just saw an opening for a job at Northwestern. So I think it's becoming more prevalent i think it just takes some time to buy in and a lot of the, a lot of times it's culture from the top down with their coaches whether or not they buy in but also having the right mental performance person who really understands what you're going through can put himself him or herself in your shoes and help you give give you the tools to get better because like you're you know right if someone could come to you and say hey here's an opportunity to get better i'm going to give you the keys to the castle like you're going to take it right like it's uh, yeah. right but you got to but you got to buy into it and that's the hardest part i think in what we do that's definitely how you hit it right on the head. That's a good deal right there. Yeah. So, so I know your season senior, your red shirt senior coming up. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. So this, this will be your last season at Vanderbilt. So t- talk to me about like what some of your goals are for next season, for the future. Like, what are you looking forward to? Yeah. I mean, I, I really just want to be able to see this team play, play at our highest level. Mm-hmm. I've, I've seen it from a defensive side a couple games, seen it from an offensive side a couple games, independent of each other uh, in my career here. And just being able to see this team play at our highest level and set that foundation for this year and years to come is going to be important for me to see that through because that's been one of my goals since I first got here. And then personally, just being able to make the plays that, that come to me and be able to be active on a defensive line, like, Obviously, that double-digit sack number is, is super important for a defensive lineman, especially an edge guy. So if I'm able to do that, I'm going to be in, in good in, in a good shape right now for, for the future that I want to have. Um, hopefully play in the NFL 10-plus years after that. Do what I have to do. Um, and then as, and beyond that, you know, I have, I have so many different things that I want to be able to do uh, off the field, um, whether that's being an NFL GM, whether that's going back and being a high school principal, impacting those those – kids from 14 to 18 years old um, as they transition to young adults, um, whether that's cont- continuing my community work through my foundation. Um, those are just some things that I can think off the top of my head that I really want to do uh, throughout my life. That, that's going to be important. Yeah. So I'll, I'll talk a little things. bit more football, but then I want to ask you about that because I know you've got a lot of big plans out off the football field. But so uh, in terms of your, did you play three, four defense? Yeah. So I've been in a three, four. Okay. So the first two years I was a three, four. I played outside backer in a 3-4. Um, and then the middle year, my junior year, I was in a multiple kind of deals. So I did a little bit of both outside backer defensive end, mm-hmm. just more so outside backer. 
And now these past two years, I've been in a four two five, so I played the 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 field end. No, the, I played the boundary stand up in a four two five. Um, this past year, this year, I'm finally where I feel like I should be. It's a, a defensive end uh, to the field and the dirt. Down at three point stands. Yeah, three point stands. Not worried about really coverage so much. Just going, going, going. So, yeah. So which which is what I what I what I feel like I'm natural at. What I can finally do best. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's many moons ago, but I remember when I was in high school, I played, I played defensive tackle, nose tackle, yeah. and then we switched our defense one week, and I had to go to stand up, play like an inside linebacker. Well, I was not made for that, right? Like as a defensive yeah, lineman, really you're only used yeah. to going forward, right? And then you get put up in space, and it's like, man, this is some hard stuff, right? Especially yeah. on the outside, in the middle, you can kind of get away with, it. <laughs> but on the outside. Mm-hmm. It's you're out there, so it sounds like you're going yeah. back to what you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you you just spoke to it. it, it I'm sure you gave a deep level of respect for those guys back there after playing that. Heck yeah. <laughs> yeah, nice. So, so tell me about. I know you have your foundation. I know you've been running some camps here locally, which is awesome. Love to see that. Like, you know, you talked about some of the things you might want to do, but I mean, tell me more about the foundation and what you're doing with it right now. Yeah, so, I mean, I started here uh, just at Vanderbilt. I mean, I've always been big and just being able to connect with people to kind of help any way I can. But being here at Vanderbilt these these first four years here or three, three and a half years, um, I just did a lot of different community service work for different organizations. Um, and a lot of people started to take notice of it and continue to build uh, that, that talk around how important community is to me um, and not for me personally, but just to understand that like impacting people's lives is important because that's the only way the world's going to get, become a better place. Um, so doing that and being able to be on the SEC community service team and the uh, good uh, all state good works hands team, just super important for me. And it allowed me to uh, connect with some people and, and spark an interest of mine uh, to start my own foundation and, and do works for people uh, that I've impacted in my life, uh, where I'm at here in Nashville, as well as my, my home state, New Jersey. Um, this is important for me to do that. I, I was I was always going to do it. I was going to wait and wait and wait until, you know, well, maybe when I'm older, or maybe when I get to the NFL, and uh, maybe this, this, and that. Well, no, like I, I've been impacting the community my whole life, and let's try to start this thing now and do it. So the foundation is uh, all for one, one for all. So I wore I wore 41 my first couple of years here. I wore number one, wear number one now, I wore it in high school. Um, it's just, you know, this all for one, one for all is like a, a good saying for people. They, they know like each individual member gives their gives their loyalty and their love to the group. And then the group gives that back to each individual member. And that's kind of what we do here at All for One for All Foundation. And we're going to do that through education and experience. I think it's important to teach people life skills that they need to be applicable to, to, to everyday life, which is why in, at some capacity, some years down the road, I want to be a high school principal. Um, teaching life skills but those life skills through education and experience as well like i'm a big travel guy i like to drive different states and go eat different food and do things that um, aren't really available to uh, a lot of people or weren't always available to me growing up i was just having them experience things they don't always have access to is important so those two things are really the pillars to our foundation Uh, my foundation is just uh education and experience yeah so so was there something that inspired you in your life when you were younger that led you to that conclusion that you wanted to do something like this? Yeah. I mean, I kind of spoke to it a little bit, but just like the impact people have had in my life that has kept me on the right track and pushed me and ascended me up on my journey just Mm -hmm. kind of spoke to me in that way. Like every step of the way in my life, I had people that poured into me and not for anything in return, and not because they knew I was going to do anything in this life, uh, but just because they they took the extra step to just be there for me. I mean, I remember, like, I mean, I talk about Coach Coach Quinn and Coach Rock and Coach Schultz a ton, but those three guys, especially in high school, were like little things, because because you know, I, I went to I don't know, I'm I'm I'm, origin- I'm really from like Asbury Park, to involved, so I would go to school about thirty minutes away, thirty five minutes away to decent drive so i would be at the facility and at the school more so than i would be at home um just hanging around and practice doing everything so those three guys every single day uh, pouring into me in different ways like staying after when i had to wait for a ride to get 
get picked up from school, have a kind of one-on-one conversation with me in a locker room about life and how, how to this decision, that decision, or just just being there for me any any way. And I still talk to those guys to this day. As I'm 22 years old, I did that when I was 14, 15, 16, 17, and I'm 22, and I still talk to them every other week. Um, so their impact on my life, pouring into me and others along the way before that and after that, that has allowed me to understand like nobody gets anywhere alone and to pour that back into other people that I'm able to impact. So yeah, that, that's kind of what sparked it. Honestly, it's just the 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 genuineness of other people. Yeah. Um, well, I have a, I have a similar experience personally and I, and I won't get into that, but I, I think, you know, it took me a lot longer, um, a, a lot later in life till I realized that, you know, like that realization that, you know, there's a lot of people who helped me along the way and I want to be able to give back in my life. And I was, you know, 20 plus years older than you when I sort of came to that point. So it kind of spe- it not kind of, it does speak to your emotional maturity that we have that awareness of like, Hey, these people are really going out of their way to make sure that I'm developing as a human being and I want to make sure that I'm returning that favor, which is, I think it's really important. You know, I think it's really important. I think, you know, we, we want to serve personally the safe population. Most of my athletes are in that high school college range. And I just love being able to help guide them through their process because, you know, it's such a, it's such a um, influential age, right? The more we can do and more resources we can give and the more just support, right. To have those kinds of coaches in your life that, not only helped you become a better football player, but a better man. And now, you know, five, six, seven years later, they're still with you. Like that's, that's not that common, truthfully. You know, it doesn't, not everybody has that experience, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and, and that's why it's so unique to me and and near dear to my heart, because I understand like, again, they did it when I was younger and they didn't have to, and they're still checking in on me now Mm -hmm. and they don't have to do it, but they do. Um, And not for anything returns because the type of type of men they are. And now it's allowed me to give back to them um, now and in their future and then other people as well. And their, 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 their impact is being seen across, across the nation. Yeah. It's funny when you were talking about the name of the foundation, all for one and one for all, I didn't realize the story behind that. So can you, can you talk about what that means specifically in terms of your experience at Vanderbilt? Yeah, I mean, it means everything just to be able to have uh, those two numbers to be able to represent uh, the foundation. Um, mm-hmm. Also, you know, represent myself on that field is just important to me. Um, it's something that people know me by um, off the field or on the field, but they're going to remember me off the field because of the, the impact that I have in the community and through this foundation um, and being able yeah. to impact their lives every day. So it's definitely significant, which is why I kind of was able to play on words with that. So it's a pretty big tradition at Vanderbilt that the captain wears number one. Is that the is that the story? Well, well, no, no, but but the the unique thing about it is like when Coach Lee got here, you had to earn your numbers. So everybody's okay. number was stripped gotcha. to a clean slate. Um, and every year he's been here, the first year and this year, you had to earn your numbers. So everybody started off with no numbers. So that that number one was unique because I had to earn it back. I had to earn it. I had it in high school. Um, gotcha. And I and I have forty one in college because obviously it's number one. Like I feel like it's a hot number for everybody that wants to get. But I had to earn it with a new staff and, and new principals. Then I had to do it again this past summer, this past year, earn it again. So it's a unique number for me because I wore it in high school and, and it's something that I the number that I love to wear. Um, and I had to earn it each year I've been here. So so how did they? How do you earn it? Like what are the criteria? Like how do they decide who gets to pick what number they have? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of just a, a multitude of things, but I say one of the main things that is a foundational point is just being able to uphold the standard of our program um, and doing that through these five covenants that we have. We have five covenants. Uh, it's mm-hmm. true brotherhood, pride in everything we do, earn it every day, player-to-player accountability, and recycle positive energy. So just upholding the standard of those five covenants yep. and truly living and breathing those things um, it's just a foundational thing is uh, how you feel like you can get on the right path to where your number and the rest is kind of just different other things. As yeah. Well. Yeah. I will, you know, and, and, and the truth of it is from like, from my perspective, from sports psychology perspective, those are things that are completely controllable, right? Those are character yes. things. Those are effort based attitude things. They're not, it's not about your performance on the field. It's about the way you, you, you uphold and represent the program. And it doesn't, doesn't take any sort of special skill to do those things. 
it just takes effort and attitude and commitment to live that life. And that's, I, I think that that kind of coaching is really important, right? Rather than rewarding the performance, which obviously you're in a performance-based business, right? That's life. But as a program, right, we hold everybody to the same standards and no one's above the program. And I think that that's, that's important, right? And that also makes for a great culture. And, and ultimately that culture leads to success on the field. Exactly, which is which has been instilled in us. This culture uh, deal has been important for us to build here, uh, with the new staff, and as a transition into the the new new wave of Vanderbilt football coming here soon. Um, and like you said, it can't. It's not performance space. You know, like <laughs> performance is so so dependent on a lot of different things. Sometimes some people don't have the guy given ability to do certain things out there on yeah. the field, but, but that doesn't mean that they're of of lesser value of another person than anybody in this program. Uh, horizontal totem pole we have right here. Everybody's the same, whether you're the head coach or anybody else. Everybody's the same horizontal totem pole. It's important to be able to do that to build that culture and then understand it. Like, hey man, it doesn't. It's not predicated on performance. It's all about the choices you make every single day. Absolutely. And the and the people who don't get onto the field or the people who don't play as much, they're still valuable to the program, right? You need yes, those people are. to succeed. You need a scout team. You need you need guys ready to go in when someone gets injured or something happens, right? Like everybody has value, you know, in that, in that process. And I think that's, that's really important. So uh, one quick, one quick question. And then I'll ask you my final question. So who do you, who do you open up with this season? Uh, Hawaii at Hawaii too. So oh, <laughs> nice. yeah, good. Another good life experience under the belt. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> good vacation. will be down there for about, I love it. Uh, I think about four or five days and just kind of get acclimated to the time zone change. Uh-huh. Kind of, uh, get around Hawaii because you know, nobody's ever been there. Maybe a handful of people, staff. Yeah. Um, and then go, go hopefully win a football game on Saturday. Excellent. Nice. A, a good business trip. A good exactly. business trip. Exactly. So, so my last question is, uh, I'll ask you, I ask everybody the same question. So, and I'll, I'll frame it as if you had to give just one piece of advice to a student athlete, high school student athlete who's listening to this conversation in terms of, you know, what they should or could be doing to put themselves in the best position to succeed, what would you say that that piece of advice would be? Yeah. I mean, I kind of give two things, uh, I'd say just make the choice. Whatever choice there is in life, uh, make the choice to do the right thing and make the choice uh, that's going to be the best for yourself. So I think a lot of times, especially when you're younger, you kind of wake up and let's see what, where the day brings me or how, well, based off how I slept, how's my day going to go? Or if this person talks to me this way, this person talks to me that way, what, what am I going to do today? How are things going to affect my day? That's kind of how... We go about life, not only when we're younger, but, but in life in general. But when you wake up every day and make the choice um, to do everything you have to do uh, every single day and understand that like, you have control over all the things that goes on in this, this life uh, in that day, and nothing can knock you off that pivot is going to be super mm-hmm. important to, to anyone in life. That's, that's the thing I'd say to high school kids. Just make the choice. Make the choice every day once you wake up to know what kind of day you're going to have. Not because there aren't going to be factors and different things are going to maybe try to knock you off that path, but just understand like you are the controller of, of, of yourself at the end of the day. That's the first thing I'll leave them with. And then the second thing I'll leave them with is just, just man, take some time out of your day to yourself and listen to a podcast, listen to uh, different audio books and read. That's something I enjoy to do uh, more, more so than anything probably in the world uh, besides playing football. It's just, I love listening to podcasts, listening to audio books, it's hard for me to sit down and just read, honestly, um, because I'm just so fidgety sometimes. But being able to just listen and have someone here to speak positive things to me to learn and gain knowledge from is important, which is why I'm just so honored to be able to have this opportunity to speak uh, on this podcast and to you because, you know, I listen to podcasts every single day and audiobooks every day. And the knowledge I gain from that is super important. So if one person gets something from this podcast, this episode would be great. Uh, because you know, then they'll be able to tell the next person, the next person, and that's kind of how people learn is through through experience or through through education. And this is a, a valuable experience for me, and being able to educate other people. So here we are. Yeah, here we are. That and that's exactly why I do what I do because I feel like these conversations and hearing about people's life experiences really is the the best way to learn. And I think that those are both great pieces of advice. So um, let me say that I want to thank you for for joining me here. It was a really Great to get to know you a little bit. 
uh, having followed you over the last few years. And uh, I only wish you the best going forward. So uh, thank you, Elijah, and have a great season. Yeah, thank you for having me. And, and I can't wait to, you know, be back hopefully soon in person with a nice in-person podcast as I get along in my career and my journey. I for sure will do it. It's a great conversation for sure. Absolutely. All right, thank man. You. Take care of yourself. Yep, have a good one. You too. So what was your biggest takeaway from my conversation with Elijah McAllister? For me, it's that we often put young athletes on a pedestal based on performance, yet we don't really know them as people. I noticed this at times during Elijah's football career at Rumson Fairhaven High School, which is just down the street from my home. Elijah demonstrates that there is so much more to young athletes than meets the eye. He is a young man of service and character that developed into a quality human being through hard work, coaching, and most of all, humility. My suggestion to young athletes is to think about what your purpose in life is beyond athletics. Having a larger purpose often allows us to have the humility required to grow and develop as a person. Doing so can also take the pressure off of a young athlete by not measuring their worth by athletic performance. I want to thank Elijah for his kind generosity and the wisdom he shared with the Freshman Foundation community. You can learn more about Elijah on Instagram at E underscore McAllister one. And you can learn more about his foundation on Instagram at all for one, one for all. So that's A L L, the numbers four, one. O-N-E-F-O-R-A-L-L. To learn how mental performance coaching can help your mind work for you rather than against you, visit michaelvhuber.com. Thank you for listening. We'll see you back soon for episode 45. Mike Huber is the founder and owner of Follow the Ball Coaching located in Fairhaven, New Jersey. He is a mental performance coach and business advisor dedicated to serving athletes just like you reach their full potential on and off the court. The Freshman Foundation is all about helping you get to the next level. For more information, follow along on Instagram at The Freshman Foundation. Please subscribe. Give us a like on iTunes, Spotify, leave a review, tell a friend. Most importantly, come back in two weeks ready to get better.